I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life of living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I've got a question from one of you, but this question comes up quite a lot, so this is not a unique one. I'm just going to answer this specific one, though, to give you guys a context. And because I raise kids here in Nicaragua, and because I have a background of having moved around a lot, a lot of you know that I therefore face the challenges of making decisions about the education for my kids. And one of the things that comes up is homeschool. Is that a good option? Is it something that makes sense? And how do you deal with some of the obvious limitations of that? And so we're going to talk about that today. We've got a specific question about it, but I'm going to do my best to answer. And as a very general people who are living abroad, so this is not a Nicaragua-focused video per se, this is about uh, socialization, integration into society, and how homeschooling may play into that, especially as if you're an expat who has kids or potentially has kids, moving abroad and their education is something you're going to be thinking about heavily and potentially worrying about. So I want to touch on that topic. Let's get to it right after the bump. All right, viewer truth teller 6743 not to be confused with truth teller 6418 who's been writing in so many times my wife and i are thinking about it we are canadian we are also we are also we also have a five-year-old we're thinking about homeschooling our boy just wondering about private school too just to help into integration into society my wife's trilingual but i'm english only working on my spanish you should be working on your french if you're canadian isn't there like a law about that joking. The liking Leon for its proximity to the ocean and cost of living. Also, I've heard that the city is well educated with great schools. Are you homeschooling? How are you educating your children? Great show. I'm subscribed. So awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I always kind of do these in reverse because like the easy things are always at the end. So yes, Leon is a city of education. It is famously, uh, it's true major export is education. It's a university town, but a big one. Hinotepe is similar on a small scale in the center of the country. And of course, Managua has more university than Leon, but it is, uh, it, it's a big city and, and it's mostly people who are staying local. Leon has the, the really big number of people who are moving to another city for that living abroad uh, kind of perspective and a great number of people who come from the western part of the country. And so we have, we have universities in the middle of town, we have a university district on the south side of town, we have a big university like small district here in the barrio of Zutiava, believe it or not, just right over here, along with a lot of private high schools as well. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a place that people travel to for for education at all levels, colegio or, or high school and uh, university. So yeah, Leon is a place for that. It's also a place where it's easy to socialize because people from all those different schools get together and go out to the clubs and stuff at night. That's not gonna apply to your five-year-old for at least several years, but as they get older, this town is great for meeting other people who are in the education zone. All right, so let's talk about some of the, the other easy things. What do we do? So we homeschool our kids. We have some very specific reasons for this that don't apply to the majority of you. And that is that we always knew we were gonna uh, live abroad since before we had our kids at uh, education age, at school age. So that is something we were planning on from the very beginning. We also knew we were going to move around a lot. We also knew that we had jobs that allowed us a great de degree of mobility and we have a lot of experience in education. So educating at home is not something that was particularly challenging for us. My wife and I have both worked in uh, like middle uh, elementary school and up education at all levels to at least some degree. Not a lot, of, not a ton, but we're able to teach those classes without a problem. We have access to family resources for younger developmental age uh, education. Um, and, and I can teach all the way through a uh, graduate program. So that's something that we have a lot of uh, resources for built in plus the age that we are just gives us access to a lot of things uh, in the world and being Texans we have a lot of resources from the state of Texas so we just have a lot of things that come together that make it that we're really well suited for doing homeschool our kids are of a temperament that's really good for homeschool uh, many of these kinds of decisions are extremely personal like no matter what I do doesn't mean it's what makes sense for you but understanding my context why we made the decisions and how it's worked out for us I think is useful um, in unless you know this doesn't work for you but also there's some things about integration and socialization that I think are universal and I really want to touch on those. Um, but uh, we also knew that we weren't just going to move abroad, but that we were going to be moving around heavily, both because we wanted to allow the education of our children to include exploring the world. So not just, for example, living in Nicaragua, of course, is one aspect of that. But we also want to be able to take our kids and, for example, study Roman history, hop on a plane, go to Italy and study Rome. And we've done that in the past. It's 
that's a great example because everyone can uh, relate to that one or one that my kids basically refuse to do because they have no interest in a society where they have to uh, dress a specific way or act a specific way or worry just because they're girls. So they make a lot of decisions about how women are treated in society, whether or not they will visit a country, which I'm very proud of them for taking a stand about that and not just saying, well, that's how the world works and I'm, I, I want to go see these tourist attractions regardless and I'm willing to... Uh, you know, help support uh, a culture that's that's not treating me well. Um, that they're, you know, young and making a point about that is is a really great thing. But we, you know, thought well, things like going to see the pyramids of Egypt, and they're just like, no, that's not a thing. That you know, if if they want to make those equally accessible to us, then by all means, we would consider going. But just going to see piles of rocks, they can look at that online. What's the point? Why go there? So they have some really great perspectives on those things. And we are able to encourage that free thinking and, and you know, getting outside the box and actually uh, taking a stand on some issues. Those are things that they're, they're doing because homeschool allows them to have the opportunity to go to Rome and the opportunity to say that this other place is someplace I'm not really interested in. So it gives them a lot of power, right? And of course, we lived in many different countries. During their school ages, at least for my older daughter, they have lived in eight different countries. That is not something you can do reasonably. Now, I know some, you know, army brats have been forced to do that, but they generally have some really strong frameworks and it creates a lot of problems for them. A lot of challenges come up from bouncing around to different schools. Even if you have a really good framework, you're always in an international school, always in your home language. But of the places we've lived, none of them have had any resources to be able to take our kids and put them in school. And all of them, except for a few have been different languages. Yes, three of them have been Spanish, one English, those they would kind of be able to function in, one Italian they would eventually be able to function in, uh, the others there was no hope that they would ever uh, get anything out of the school. But realistically, even going to a Spanish school, they would have a lot of struggles. They're, they are learning Spanish. Getting an education where they're getting a lot of Spanish would be very good for them. But ultimately, not being fluent Spanish speakers, especially when they started school, now, yes, they could potentially attend a Spanish language school, to, a school that teaches in Spanish today. But if they were to have started there, they would have been at such an, a huge disadvantage because the, none of the schools had any resources to teach them Spanish. They expected people to know Spanish already, and they have no uh, accommodations for someone who doesn't speak Spanish to be in those schools. So my kids would be thrown in, and we, you know, now we speak Spanish, but when they started, we did not. So we had very few resources to help them at home. Uh, it, it just they would have been put at a major disadvantage with school being something that they, they would not have integrated, they would not have gotten an education. Eventually, yes, they would have learned Spanish, and eventually, yes, they would have been years behind and started to catch up, but there's uh, major problems for that. When you talk about uh, Spanish-first students who are, for example, going to school in the United States and they're going to a public school, the United States provides a huge number, under normal circumstances, a huge number of resources to either provide education in that language or, far more likely, to provide the resources so that they can learn English and start taking classes in English. The school has some amount of ability to accommodate that. And even if the school itself doesn't, they normally have resources in a, in a larger ecosystem that can. Absolutely exceptions to that. And a lot of those things are newer. When I was in school, we didn't have those accommodations. They couldn't even teach languages uh, in foreign language classes. Those are things we all lack. So that's one of the reasons why we don't really speak Spanish today, even though I wanted to. I wanted to take foreign language from the time I was very young. It was not offered to me until I was 14. And when it was offered to me at 14, it was a native German speaker who spoke Ukrainian at home who was attempting to teach something like her fifth language uh, in a class that we only got to take for three years all of us having no background whatsoever and absolutely zero resources to hear or practice Spanish anywhere else. What we learned in school was all but useless. My fourth year ended up being Latin American studies, not language studies, more or less. It didn't hurt to take that. It probably propelled uh, my, my Spanish just slightly, but it was extremely slightly, kind of like learning to be a little bit better at Spanish by learning some place names. So that gives a background. So basically, schools are ruled out for most people who are expatting to a country that doesn't speak their native language because your kids just won't get the education that they need, and that alone should normally rule that out. I also want to point out, I had someone on a separate comment get really snarky, and of course it's just one of those we don't like foreigners coming to our country, and as always I point out that we have no reason to believe that this person actually lived in this country, um, but was very likely just someone from another country who, because 
the people who don't like us coming here are generally people from somewhere else, people who are jealous because they wish they could be here or whatever. They feel trapped and, and seeing people who have more freedom makes them very, very angry and they lash out. So we, that's what we expect it is. I do not expect the number of times that I've heard someone complain about me being here as an American living in Nicaragua from a Nicaraguan is, let me, let me count it up, zero. Never once have I had a person that I could tell reliably actually lived in Nicaragua. Some people who claim to online anonymously, yes, but real people that I can verify, zero. I guarantee there's somewhere there's a Nicaraguan who wishes immigrants didn't come here. Of course there is, but is that something you're really going to run into? Maybe, but it's extremely, extremely rare. And uh, but so this comment, and it's worth noting though, one of the things they said is they were they were angry that I didn't put my kids into uh, the local public school because if I don't do that, I'm not giving them a chance to integrate into society, and that's my duty apparently in living here is to make my kids integrate. So that my kids should integrate into society in that way is not actually a rule and probably not very logical. We're going to talk about kind of a framework around that shortly, but. All, it's based on this false conclusion that this is how it should be treated. And then the idea, one, that they could go to public school. Um, we're tourists here. We don't have the right to use the public school system. Of course, we could beg the school and under some conditions, they may let us go there. Understood, but that is not appropriate under normal circumstances. If we were in a position where we were destitute and we really wanted to get an education for our kids and we had no other option, going to Nicaragua and begging them to educate our kids because we can't do it, sure do what's right for your kids by all means and Nicaragua probably will find a way to help you because that's the kind of country it is but just assuming that we can go to a public school and be like hey here's our kids babysit them for free no they don't have the resources for that they don't have a mandate to do that for every tourist who decides to stop by and it's just not appropriate under normal circumstances the second thing is even if I could convince them to do that or I got residency first and then maybe I could convince them to do that under residency I don't even know if they would do it then is the school would still be in Spanish and has no accommodation for my English speaking kids and no way to teach them Spanish. And I have really good friends who work with my kids who are public school educators here in Nicaragua. So I have very first hand information about the public school system because we are involved in it in some way, just not with our kids attending the classes. So we know that they would be unable to have my kids in the class. This would cause major problems because they would not be able to educate them. My kids would have nothing to do. It would cause a disruption to the class and potentially cause a, a a financial problem for the school as they tried to deal with extra students that they have no tax base uh, to, to handle being there. Now, of course, we could donate money to the school. We could help out financially. And of course, we would. But the, just the idea of the school taking foreign tourists or even foreign residents as students for no particular reason doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not good for Nicaragua. It's not good for my kids. It would be disruptive to the other students. It's not really fair to them. Uh, it's not really fair to my children either. And very importantly, at the end of the day, the idea that going to a place where you don't speak the language, sitting in the class, causing disruption, and having an absolutely unique experience, different from anyone else in the world, different from normal expats, different from di normal world travelers, and different from Nicaraguans, would not in any way move them towards integration. It would actually teach them that integration was out of their reach and exacerbate a problem, in my opinion, rather than assisting in it. I understand the desire for integration where possible, and I promote it as much as is reasonable, but this is not a thing that would be on the path to that at all. And that actually is a important point, I think, about what we're going to talk about. So what people tend to, and I just read uh, you what was, was written, as a question, uh, most people, when you're talking about homeschool, start talking about, well, they're worried about socialization and integration. And before I go into homeschooling, I want to give a little bit of my own background of my own education. So I started K through 8th going to a private school in upstate New York. It's a very small school. I had the largest class, actually, that ever passed through the school. And we had a class of 18 students. Most of the classes were under 12, and many of them were only like 5 to 6. Even with 18 students passing through, my class, setting the record for the largest class ever only graduated one. Now notice I left by age 14, so I was not in that group at the end, but it dwindled quickly from 18 at our peak down to one at the end. By the time I left, I think we were around 11. 
That's a really small school, and very importantly, it did absolutely nothing to integrate me into society, into New York culture, into anything. If anything, that school was designed to keep us apart from everyone. So just going to school, and importantly, the types of schools that are open to foreigners when traveling to different countries, private ones, very rarely are actually designed towards integration. They're actually often designed towards anti-integration. That's not always the case, but it can be, and you have to assume that any given school is not actually going to be providing this integrating cultural experience. That's rarely a goal that they're given or a mandate. It just doesn't really make sense because why would someone actually be looking at that from a private school? No, the purpose of their school is to somehow give them an advantage, and part of that advantage is probably not just integrating. If you're just going to integrate, just don't bother. But it's also important that just by doing something or being someone different can keep integration from happening. And to some degree, that's just something you have to accept. Now, I did switch to public school at age 14. I spent my entire high school age, 14, 15, 16, and 17, in public school. And I went to a pretty good public school, and I'm very happy with my experience there. So I've, I have no qualms about that. They were a great uh, school from an education perspective. However, I think it's really important to point out that in no way did I feel that other than exposing me to what public school meant to other people and knowing the extent of what integration actually was, do I feel that public school actually helped me integrate into society in some way? I'm not saying it hurt or that they tried to set me apart. No, it's not at all what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say that by going to public school, I didn't somehow get this amazing uh, integration into things that I wasn't getting before. And my private school was trying to non-integrate me. They wanted to make sure I felt isolated and alone. That was tough. That is something I definitely want to avoid, and I recommend people be very wary of schools doing that to your kids. But public school wasn't built around integration. It was built around a combination of babysitting, of course, and education. I was lucky mine was way more weighted towards education than babysitting, and definitely way more than most schools are today. But that still remains that either they're educating or they're babysitting. They're not worried about making your kids productive members of an integrated society. That's just not what they're doing. If they have any mandate at all, it is to encourage your kids to be good, quiet workers who do what both business and government tell them to do. That's the only thing that governments or businesses are ever going to sponsor, and it's the only thing we can expect them to do. That is the logical response. So that's what you get, and it's very obvious if you go through the system. Again, I was very lucky. Mine had a lot of free thinking, and really, I got a better education in my high school than I did in university in many cases. So I'm very thankful for where I ended up, uh, but integration just isn't this thing that school's really able to provide. And it's also questionable whether it's something you want. Why would you want someone to integrate? If I was moving to America and uh, I was an immigrant there, or as someone who kind of behaved as an immigrant there, even though my family was colonial, why would I seek to have been integrated into American society? Understanding how to operate in it, absolutely. Having an appreciation for what other people go through, Absolutely. H having a, a really clear picture of what the standard education process is for most people, valuable to some degree. All those things are true, but integrating me into society and making me just another cog in the wheel, is that actually an end goal for anyone that you actually care about their opinion? Is it good for your kids? I don't think so. Is it good for the society you're trying to pressure them into integrating into? No, probably not. It's not a win-win situation. When I went on to work I worked across a, a huge number. I've, I've done some videos about places that I've worked, uh, and I've had the ability to work all over the United States in an unbelievable range of different careers and work in some of the top echelons of American business, including at multiple of the world's largest companies in some of their absolutely top roles and as they interface with top roles of government. And at, now I work internationally at the top levels of government and in business still. And one of the things we always noticed is that the people who are integrated they tend to be working in McDonald's. They tend to be working in a factory. They tend to have very boring, low-paying jobs where we tend to then look at them and say, well, I'm not super proud of where they ended up. Not that there's anything wrong with those jobs in any way whatsoever, but they're jobs that tend to be low-paying and are not things that people are going to go out and brag about at a society level. Again, just being a cog in the wheel is perfectly fine. I'm not encouraging people to look down on those roles. Anything but the... But the but but the way that I want people to look at that. But when you're looking at, well, who's the top performers? When you get to the highest salaries, when you get to the highest levels of, of responsibility, when you get to places 
that you're really bragging about or no longer bragging about the work that you do because you can't really talk about it. When you get into those roles, one of the things I always found is that the people we were working with, none of us had a shared background. Everybody's story was completely unique. One kid was an army brat and moved from place to place and had no shared experience with anyone. Someone else was from a different country where their educational process was utterly different than the one that we had. Someone else went to private school. Someone else was homeschooled. Someone else was public schooled. All those things were represented. What thing they went through in that standardization process, where they did it, none of those things were applicable. What mattered is that they were able to think critically and had a good education, whether formal or informal, whether they even went to university or not, not relevant. And honestly, when you're working in the absolute top 1%, when you're making the really high salaries, your job is about performance. They don't look at your education. I could have skipped high school altogether and still gotten that job. They would never have looked into it because a job that's taking it seriously never will. By definition, if they look up your education, they're not looking for performance and therefore they're not even in the top 50% of jobs. They're in the, we're just putting a butt in the seat kind of jobs and they're looking for some kind of basic cover their butts to explain why they hired this particular person because it's a visible criteria. But companies that actually care about turning out results, all they care about is results. Results are results. You don't look at other things when you want results. That's the nature of results. So one of the things that just, just really got driven home, working on Wall Street, working in Hedge Fund Row, working with governments, is that all the things that people push as standard, as integration, as this is what everyone does, the you have to do, you have to have a degree to do all these things, all those things fell away as you got into those competitive roles. And so because of that, I'm strongly encouraged that I don't know that going to an, a, a program that's likely to integrate you even has benefits for you professionally, let alone culturally. And do you actually want to be integrated in that way? So I live in Nicaragua and obviously I'm not integrated, but I do remember, I do push the idea of being integrated into the society that you move to strongly. I'm not here to promote the idea of coming and living in an enclave and, and pulling a, a piece of society from somewhere else and choosing what you want and then living in Nicaragua, but not in Nicaragua. No, anything but. I love Nicaragua, not just it's a great country, but I love the people and the culture and, and the restaurants and going out and being a part of things. I want to be integrated in so many ways. But the reality is, and this is just a truth I and you have to live with, is that we will never be Nicaraguan. That's not going to happen. Not for me, not for my kids. My kids have been here already to some degree for nine years, three years, completely solid. But they first came here nine years ago. To them, Nicaragua is part of their mindset. I mean, my youngest was learning how to swim when she first got here. She was only uh, four years old or turned four years old when we moved here. I'd have to do the math separately. So they were very young. Nicaragua has always played into what they see as a worldview. But no matter how much that's true, even if they attended public school, they would never even start to be integrated for a lot of reasons. One, they're business owners here. They are clearly not Nicaraguan. Their background comes from somewhere else. Their initial first language is English. Yes, they're learning Spanish and they're doing their best to learn it better and become fluent and they want to be able to act as integrated as possible in society. But as possible is a really important word here because there's absolutely no possible way that they're ever going to actually integrate. And so doing a bunch of things to harm their future and potentially harm their childhood, not that going to public school would is harmful, but for my kids to go to a public school where they don't speak the language, where they're not getting the uh, flexibility and advantages that we're able to give them through homeschooling, that would harm them. They would hold them back academically. It would hold them back socially. It would potentially be mentally damaging. It would be an extremely stressful thing, and it would cause them to spend their childhoods away from us and in a less flexible way for no reason. It would simply harm them without any actual upsides, or the only potential upside would ha be having a relatively deep understanding of what other people have as a high school educational context. They wouldn't know what it's really like to, to go through it, but they would have a little bit better of a context for that. It's worth noting that in Nicaragua, an incredibly high number of people don't use the public education system. Now, homeschooling, all but unheard of, for Nicara the Nicaraguense. But what they do tend to do is use private schools, whether religious ones or just purely educational ones or government ones or whatever. Private schools are the, the 
kind of goal. It's seen as a thing that you want to do, which means that even Nicaraguans seeking to have advantages for their kids. And this includes people who are just barely looking at maybe skirting the lower end of middle income. That middle income zone immediately starts sending their kids to private school because it provides a big opportunity for them in flexibility and education and all kinds of things. And hopefully in many cases in English. And some even go out and get private classes. Uh, people that are on my show all the time, their kids go to private school and take private English classes on top because those are things that are very difficult to get in a school setting and are very important for flexibility and future uh, job and career opportunities. So those are things that they go out and make an effort to get separately. And all those things technically make them struggle to integrate as well. Now, of course, being Nicaraguense means that to some degree, they just are what you're trying to integrate with. It doesn't matter what their experience is, they are Nicaraguense. And you could say the same thing about me growing up in Western New York, I was born there. I'm a New Yorker. My family first came to New York around 1619, been there ever since. Now, some of my family moved away, some moved back, but the point is we were one of the founders of the original Dutch colony before the British came and colonized us. And, uh, and I'm still from that place. I, that, that long, long, long history, you could say, well, whatever it is that I am, that's what people need to integrate with in Western New York. And that's kind of reasonable. But growing up there, I always felt like an outsider, not necessarily because I went to private school, but that didn't help. But it was just a place that I never felt like I really fit in. And you can see why living in Nicaragua, I do feel like I fit in at least much better. And so that's probably, I just wasn't a good fit for what the culture was like. And don't get me wrong, I love Western New York. I love where I came from. It was a great place to grow up. It was very safe. The weather was terrible, uh, but there's a lot of good things about it. Amazing food, really interesting culture, a lot of dynamic uh, uh, life experiences that you really don't get very many places. I think it's one of the best places, maybe the best of the United States, and it's one of the most overlooked. And that's one of the things I love about it. It's a region of the United States that has no tourists. And so we had our own experience uh, that was very much our own. We were, we were not globalized at the time. And while I'm a big proponent of globalization, it's an entire aspect of, of uh, life that often is unavoidable today. And growing up in Western New York gave me, as an adult who is uh, stuck being globalized and don't, uh, doesn't really have any way to escape it, it gave me a childhood that was very different from that. And so I got two really unique experiences. And that was really important to me, I think. Uh, and, and I just really love where I'm from. And if you're ever in the area, right, everything from uh, about Ithaca on the, the southeast corner to Rochester and Buffalo in the northwest, that region which is mostly uh, originally when I was from there, the Finger Lakes and the Niagara Frontier is an absolutely phenomenal area. And you can find things to do. If you want to be a tourist there, uh, the wine country, the food experiences in all of those cities, some of the old city downtowns, walking the cities, the lake fronts, both the Great Lakes and the Finger Lakes, uh, the parks, the Grand Canyon of the East, the Portage uh, uh, Canyon at Letra State Park. Uh, Watkins Glen with its uh, great array of waterfalls, Niagara Falls, of course, uh, the bridges into Canada, all of those things. It is a truly epic region. It's hard to really describe what a great place it is to be from. But even having been born there, raised there, lived there my entire life as a kid, I never felt like it was my place really in the way that I do with Nicaragua. So sometimes the idea of integration sounds really good, but it's hard to actually define what we even mean by it. And even if we know what we mean, does it actually represent a value in most cases? So integrating where you live, like here in Nicaragua with my kids and my family, doing what we can to integrate in society, being good participants and good members of society, where we're understanding people's position, where we're trying to speak the language, we participate with people in uh, family events and cultural events, and um, that could be at all echelons of society, whether it's, oh, we're going to the big, you know, government, like, like revolutionary uh, Independence Day party. Okay, great, we're gonna do that. That's like this entire society thing gets together. Well, we're also gonna go to like our city-wide, you know, whatever parade for the saint of the city. Great, then we're doing the city thing. And we're going to go to, uh, you know, our local town or barrios like block party or, you know, throwing a concert thing just because, you know, because we're just getting together as society. Great. We got this thing. And then we got our, our, like our local group every week we get together and go to this bar, go to this concert or whatever. Okay. We got this. And then we have friends and family and they're going to have a birthday party or their kids are throwing a party. And we go to those things and we get involved and we try to be, uh, you know, normal members of society. Now, obviously we're always going to stand out. And that's one of the things you just have to accept. You're always going to be that foreigner 
who's trying to be a part of society. And the people who've done this, who've been really successful at this, have been quite successful. I know people who have lived here a long time. I'm just moving the camera and uh, trying to get a little bit better light for, because I just had to reset the one, completely died, and I moved on to the secondary camera. Um, you know, some people have done this, so they've lived here for decades, and they really, you know, they, they speak Spanish fluently. They get to know so many people. But we know people, right, who've lived here for extraordinary amounts of time and have really learned the language and really got to know people and they know people everywhere and they can walk in anywhere and everyone's friends and they're they're great members of society but are they integrated are they in any way really blending and the answer is no not a single one of them it's not the case and i don't think that that is a valuable goal i don't think it makes sense because it, it's not reasonable to think that you can and there's no actual reason to see being confused for a local as good as being a good member of society. So there's a, there's a difference between integrating and, and having a shared experience to the most extreme degree and, and simply being a good member of society and being beneficial to society and being uh, someone that, that not just you know the government wants or your city wants, but that your neighbors wants and your friends want. Then of course, and we mentioned this, integration itself isn't a goal. Your goal is to do what's best for your kids, what's gonna make them healthy and happy and successful. And you know, healthy and happy come first. Success is very arbitrary as a designation, but these are really important things that you need to consider is, is integrating your kids into society something that one can even be done. But if you make the effort, if you make the attempt, is that going to be good for them in the long run or are you just giving them disadvantages? Because really that's what we may be talking about is not doing something to make your kids great members of society. Being integrated doesn't imply that they're gonna be better members of society. All it really implies is taking away the advantages that they may otherwise have available to them. And is that really something that we want to do to our own kids? Not really. Everyone, everyone, right, wants to do the best thing for their kids. They want to have a way to give them the best uh, leg up on the competition, to give them the most options in life, to give them uh, opportunities and flexibility so that when they grow up, they can uh, feel safe and secure, but also have the ability to choose what they want to do and go out and do those things and not be limited by uh, what, what their backgrounds are any more than absolutely necessary. We are all limited by our backgrounds and everyone is, right? There's no one who isn't, but some have much more limiting backgrounds than others. And just by the nature of, and I'm going to guess the majority of you having kids and making this conversation are holding US and Canadian passports. Well, if you want your kids to integrate into Nicaraguan society, there's only two things that really make it a huge barrier that you can actually change. One is that they're currently carrying powerful passports that allow them to move anywhere in the world. This alone means that nothing that they ever do in Nicaragua is going to be an equatable experience to Nicaraguans. This is always going to be something that sets them apart, having that powerful passport and the option to move anywhere they want in the world anytime. So if you want to start talking about integration, you need to take that passport away from your children for forever and take away the future flexibility and protections that it provides. The second is income. The majority of those coming from foreign countries have both the right to earn foreign income, you'll have to sever that in some way, and they generally have an amount of income that is vastly uh, in excess of what normal Nicaraguans would that we would be integrating with as, because that's an important thing. Are you integrating with the upper echelons of society? Are you uh, integrating with, with people who are at more average income rates? Well, if you want to do that, you have to lower their expectations to be capped at those income rates. Those are terrible things that are that are forced on Nicaraguan society. Those are terrible aspects that we all wish we could change. At least we sure hope that you want to be able to change those things, but they're not within our power to snap our fingers and fix. If they were, they'd be fixed already. But if you want your kids to integrate, how are they ever going to integrate if those completely life-defining aspects of Nicaraguan society cannot be also hoisted upon them? One, I don't even know if you have the ability to take away the advantages that they have, and you would never do so if you could. So that sounds like an absurd example, but the point is, is that in order to start to integrate your children in any meaningful way, you would have to cripple the advantages that they have. And that would also put them in a really terrible position because they will never pass for a Nicaraguan. So they will always be at a disadvantage if all other things are equal living in Nicaragua. Under normal circumstances, all of the things are not equal and they have massive advantages over the average Nicaraguan, which is unfair, but it's not something we can control. 
But if you took away, if in theory you took away all those advantages and all they were was an, uh, a, a gringo child who grew up in Nicaragua with a Nicaraguan education and Nicaraguan income and Nicaraguan passport and Nicaraguan right to work and only speak Spanish and you take away their English. Well, some, some Nicaraguans speak English, but you never speak English at home, so eventually their English decays and so it starts to have a strong accent and, and people start to mistake them as a non-native speaker. Once that has happened, then you could start to see what integration would actually look like, except because they would be visibly under 99.99% of circumstances, not from Nicaragua. They would always be targets for gringo pricing. They would always be targets for, uh, you know, people not wanting to give them a job because they want to give it to a Nicaraguan. All kinds of things would happen even if they were Nicaraguan. So that doesn't really make sense. It, it, would, it would hurt them so much. And it's all just really a thought experiment. Obviously, it's very hard to do those things, and you wouldn't do those things. But because you wouldn't do those things, why would you also send them to school if sending them to school didn't carry some very specific advantages? Clearly, integration on its own uh, is not an advantage where it doesn't make sense. We use integration uh, as kind of a tool to try to convince people to not do the best thing for themselves and for their offspring, but that's that's not healthy, right? And, it, and no one's going to benefit from that. Nicaragua's not gonna benefit from that. You're not gonna benefit from that. Your kids are not gonna benefit from that. What they are gonna be benefit from is doing what they can to gain an important contextual uh, visibility onto Nicaraguan society to really understand where Nicaraguans are coming from as best as we can, right? As foreigners, we're never gonna have that complete visibility, but we can get a lot better at it, especially if they're growing up here, especially if your son is five, he has an opportunity to really, really understand Nicaraguan society and simply do so like a Nicaraguan who is leveraging a bunch of advantages, having the advantage of another citizenship, advantages of a higher income, advantages of speaking English natively at home, advantages of educational flexibility that go to the most extreme levels of Nicaraguan society. Leverage those things, but certainly have them participate with local friends, be a member of your community, go out and do uh, things with locals instead of finding expats and isolating yourselves or your kids and their, their friends into groups of expats. Make an effort to don't cut off the expats. Every Nicaraguan kid is like, I'd love to meet some expats. That'd be interesting. That'd be fun. Let's do that. That would be different. Don't make your kids different in that way that you're avoiding expats, but also don't make them cut off from Nicaraguan society. So the thing that you need to do is become a member of your local community, right? Go out and attend functions, go to events, get to know other parents and figure out how kids interact. Now, a lot of times kids interact by running around on the street and just playing organically. And that's very tough for someone coming from North America to internalize that that's something you can safely do and that is done the world over, just not in North America. North America is so completely opposed to children going out and socializing naturally, but that is what kids still do. And especially in places like Nicaragua, you gotta let them do that or they're not going uh, to be able to, to integrate. Now, something that would, as an example, be a good way to go. I have uh, Marcella from my show. She lives in a very nice little gated community in a very non-expat. No, I did talk to someone who said, oh, I know an expat who's been there for over 20 years, 30 years, uh, in Ciudad Sandino. Um, and, uh, you know, that's picking a town like that where there aren't many expats around, where you're not going to see other expat kids, and moving into a cute little middle, you know, middle income, middle class, uh, a gated community, get a house the same as everyone else, look the same as everyone else from the outside, drive a normal car the same as everyone else, shop in the same places. Uh, at you can even go so far as really working hard to integrate the cuisine that locally, like what do people normally eat? Okay, grilled chicken, rice and beans, that's gonna be our, a, a really common dinner. Right now I'm vegetarian, so it doesn't work for me, but you could adopt a lot of those things at home and you know change your breakfast. Are you doing bacon and eggs and, and toast? Well, change that up, make it eggs and gallo pinto and, and queso frito and maybe some Maduro when you feel like going that extra mile. You know, get get those kinds of experiences as, as part of your everyday life. Live in a little community where the, you're the only expats. Have a gated community where you feel really confident letting your kid just run out. Maybe not when he's five, right? Get, be reasonable. But when he's seven, right, teach him about road safety. Make sure he's wary of cars. Don't integrate with Nicaraguans to the point where he gets run over because he didn't look for cars. That's a cultural thing that you do not want to copy. But get him to where he's wary of cars. Let him go out and go to the neighbor's house and play video games at his house or run around the street and play play soccer, learn to have 
baseball, attend baseball games, do things, go hang out with the neighbors when they go to the bar, go hang out with the neighbors when they go to a parade, like do that stuff. Be a member of your community really strong and let your kid be his own member of your community. And of course, get them private Spanish lessons, get that Spanish good fast, do those things. You're going to find, I think, really easily that you get an effective level, level of integration where you have a good opportunity to be really amazing members of society without going through some absurd level of integration that causes harm to you, your, your kids, or maybe even society in general. You want to do the best thing for everybody. And, and there is a spot here where everybody wins and everyone's happy. And uh, there's always going to be some complainer somewhere. You have this real opportunity to get to that place. And you just have to think a little bit outside the box because typically you're always getting messages from people who are trying to sell public school or sell integration, um, people who don't have you or your kid's interest at heart and quite often don't have society's interest at heart either. Often people who are calling for integration, like this person posting on, on my vlog, we're not actually hoping for integration. They're hoping to make me feel uncomfortable and push me out. That's not what most people are saying. And when I say you should integrate whenever possible, I'm certainly not encouraging you not to come. No, definitely come. Do what integration makes sense. Go do the local activities. Learn to enjoy as many things like Nicaraguans do as they do. There's a limit, right? Maybe you don't like Nicaraguan music. You can't make yourself, well, it is what it is, right? Maybe learn to tolerate it. I wear earplugs when I go out to bars because it's louder than I can handle, but I don't want to not go out and hang out with people in the same way. So I adapt. I put in earplugs. Yeah, I look a little bit silly. Yeah, they laugh about it. Yeah, I have to pull them out every time I'm talking to someone, but it lets me be there and do those things in the same way that Nicaraguans would. And it really does a lot to help me integrate into my local town. And it's helped make a lot of friends that we hang out with that, you know, have absolutely no connection through any expats. They're just locals that we've met in that way. I have two final points that I want to make that I think are really important, but are not actually part of the educational uh, arena itself. The first thing that we're going to touch on is globalization. The world that your kids, my kids are growing up in or going to grow up in is one where the world is very interconnected and people are working across borders all the time. Even at my age, pushing 50 years old, the world was highly globalized. And the idea that you lived in a solitary place instead of moving around, the idea that you would not work online, the idea that you would work with people only from where you grew up, that you needed to be isolated to a, a, a certain area, was all gone. I went to university far away from home. I got my first jobs far away from home, constantly moved, constantly on uh, an adventure of culture and, and uh, location and, and job types. In the future, this is only going to accelerate. People may not have to physically move as often as they used to, and this will allow that some amount of individual cultures in different areas will carry on and fight some of the globalization of culture. But the idea that uh, the people you work with, the people you interact with over much of your life are going to be from only the same integrated culture that you grew up in is gone and should not be expected in any way and should not have been for quite some time. So if you have a child today who's going to be entering school, doing so with an eye towards integration, while that potentially has a lot of benefits for socialization and, and getting to know where they are and just being a good citizen of the place that you're in as much as possible, of course, every time we're going to say that. But doing so because it's somehow going to be beneficial to their long-term career uh, or job options or their ability to function throughout different roles in society, I think is misguided. I think it actually hurts them more than anything. Having a diverse background uh, is going to be the most beneficial thing, the best education, the most uh, ability to leverage your interest by homeschooling. For example, this uh, gives you more opportunity for, let's say your son decides that he's really interested in math or science or something very specific. Maybe he's interested in being a veterinarian, but only for two cans. Well, a normal uh, K through 12 experience isn't going to address that in any way, maybe a basic biology class. But even that, you may end up uh, in many American public schools, that education is worthless. Here in Nicaragua, famously, that kind of stuff doesn't tend to be very good. It's not that much different than other places in the world, but it's just not something that they're good at teaching at that level. But if that's something you want to teach at home, you could definitely give an education that takes him into that 10,000 hour mark to be one of the best in his field before he even graduates high school. That's not something you can generally do when someone goes to public school. You just don't have the time. You have all this homework, all this sitting in class, all this transit, all these things that keep your, your kids busy, but don't keep them educated, 
and don't keep them interested. And those are things you can leverage. Don't take that away unless you have a really specific reason to do so. Uh, but globalization is going to change the game completely, and it really has already totally changed what we see as beneficial and not beneficial to someone's education. It's worth pointing out that years ago, long before uh, globalization became a thing, we used to say, and I worked in university circles, we would say this to people who were looking to, to look at their kids' educations, that an important thing to consider is that one year of traveling the world and seeing different countries and different cultures and like making an effort to just get to know people, right? Not doing any particular work, not writing a book, not researching a paper, not, you know, getting involved in politics, nothing of the sort, just traveling, having beers, doing some surfing, walking some trails, you know, hanging out with locals, avoiding other backpackers for the most part, but just seeing the world was considered to be more valuable both in how much it made you a good member of society and in how much it did to promote your career options than a four-year degree would do. That's quite a statement. Now, partly that is because a four-year degree does far, far less than people like to promote. Most people who talk about it are in the position to sell education. And so either they're selling it directly or they're in a position to benefit economically by keeping other people down. And Putting people in the university is a major way of doing that, so always be cautious of people who are pushing you to spend huge amounts of money without being able to articulate the actual benefits, especially when the benefits they mention normally are negatives. They just put them in a tone of sounding good, uh, but also because traveling the world and getting to know other cultures broadens you very quickly, makes you potentially a better world citizen. You have to be more than just a good local citizen. You want to be a good world citizen to be a good local citizen. One of the, the most dangerous things that you could have is someone who only gets local integration and nothing else because they get skewed and crazy ideas from, you know, one local teacher who decides to tell them something crazy about the world and there isn't necessarily any course correction and you end up with wild results. There's reasons why uh, education can be really beneficial or really dangerous because formal educational institutions have a tendency to isolate students and keep them from broadening their minds. Travel is one of those things that's very difficult to do extensive travel, live abroad, travel abroad, and not get exposed to a lot of things. You can't keep yourself isolated very well. So it's one of the reasons that we push for living abroad or at least traveling heavily because it really does a lot to fight isolationism, xenophobia, uh, educational gaps, uh, racism, all those things tend to fall away when you get out and see the world for what it is and realize that people are more alike than not alike, to know what differences in cultures actually mean, how different systems that you think wouldn't make any sense or doesn't work in your worldview, and realize that places that have those completely different uh, worldviews often function really well, maybe better uh, to understand which things from your own perspective are just propaganda or are, uh, you know, informational from the government, promotional things from your government or society society or whatever, and seeing other places and being able to bring that perspective back makes you more valuable, uh, even within just your own local community. It helps you not just go along with what everyone says, but to be a independent, rational voice. And that's a really important thing for any citizen of any place. The other thing that we have to consider is social media. Now, this is a little bit different than integration. This is socialization. But it's also important to understand that uh, students today, even, even at quite a bit older than students today, <clears throat> I live in a world where being connected digitally is the in-person, right? It's easy for us who grew up with the world only being in person, and I grew up in a world where we really didn't have long distance calling in any reasonable way. So the idea of talking to my friends meant I had to see them in person all through my childhood, much like it was the 1940s rather than the 1980s when I actually was a kid. Uh, but just because of where I grew up in Western New York, we didn't have the same deregulated telephone systems that the rest of the country did. So we didn't have the ability to really call up our friends and hang out on the phone the way that you saw kids even in the the 1960s and movies doing. So we were really, really isolated from each other back in that day. And seeing kids today with social media, it, it warms the cockles of my heart to see that people are actually interacting with other humans. Sure, it's through a digital media, but is that really such a negative? Sure, through our old eyes, it doesn't seem like the kind of social interaction that we approve of. But that's just us being old. In reality, it is so much better than what we ever had. Now you can complain about things like people bullying or whatever, but we were bullied all the time when we were young, and it was physical and actually scary. Now it's more emotional, and there's more we can do to combat it. We're just aware of it or willing to talk about it now. We were 
really, really willing to sweep it under the rug before and people died all the time and we just didn't care that much. Honestly, that's the difference in society is suddenly we care a whole lot more and things that have always been bad are simply being exposed instead of being ignored. But social media and digital world is not what's creating that. That is not in any way pushing that more in that direction. It's just giving us visibility into it and in many cases the tools to combat it. So be thankful for that. But social media means a lot of things. It means that your kid growing up in this world doesn't need to go to school and sit by people and see them sitting in other chairs to have socialization. If that's even socialization, I don't know how it is. It's anything but socialization. It's teaching you that you can sit in a room with other people and not interact like humans. That's horrible. What you want is someone who feels free to communicate with people all the time and does so freely. So, uh, social media has given us an entire new world where communications with people that we see all the time or just once in a while, you know, meeting new people, all those things are things that happen so much more readily. My kids meet and greet new people with so much more regularity than, than I did through my childhood, even though I was always out of the house and you know in a position to potentially meet people, there were no new people there. Once you went to school and met the handful of people that were there, here you are in your little village. And that's something that, while that was my experience in the United States in the 1980s going to elementary school, that's exactly the same as it's going to be here in Nicaragua. If you go to the local school in Ponaloya, which was on the, uh, uh, the, the Cheap Traveler show, now I can't remember the name of the show, uh, that was so good that filmed down there and helped build uh, bathroom facilities for that school, they, um, uh, the budget travelers, they, uh, uh, that school, like if you were to go there, they have classes that are very similar in size to what I went to and absolutely no integration with outside world. So you're stuck with just this tiny number of students. And if you get along with them, great. If you don't too bad, that's what you have. And, uh, you don't get this broader sense and you don't integrate into Nicaragua as a whole. Basically, if you ever move away from the beach, what was the point of that integration? You gave it all up because that's part of the Nicaraguan experience today is people still lack the ability to migrate between the cities and sure if that was a goal but why would they do it they don't have any resources in that new city they still stay close to home that's not an integration that makes a whole lot of sense but social media is breaking them free of that so even though you go to school in a little place they're communicating with people all over the country they're communicating with people in different uh regions of the country in different countries it's the experiences are so different and you know here if, as an expat, one of the things you'll notice is that people who are in high school or university are going to reach out. They're going to see you somewhere and they're going to be like, hey, I saw you online or hey, I saw you. you. You live somewhere near my community and have conversations. Can I ask you a question? Can, I, can you speak English to me? Can you? And the, the things we would never have done uh, in the 1980s, we would never have as, as kids, even university students just reached out and been like, I want to communicate and get to know the world. I want to meet a person from another country. I want to whatever. But if you're here in Nicaragua, that's going to happen because social media has made that so accessible and you don't have to walk up and interrupt someone in the street and be like, Hey, you look like a foreigner. Can I talk to you? Cause I just want to talk to a foreigner. That'd be weird and kind of scary and, and super awkward and, and really interrupt their life. But with social media, they're able to leave a message. Hey, you, you take a bunch of pictures in this town that I'm in, right? A lot of this is how it happens to me. I do photography of very specific spots. I do uh, take pictures of like street art and uh, murals and things and old fallen down buildings and people can find me really easily. And sometimes I have people reach out and are like, hey, I just want to chat with someone who's into photography, into, you know, artwork, into Nicaragua or just from another country. And I never, you know, one of my employees, I was at the bar with him two nights ago and he's like, I just want to talk English to you. Now, of course, he's one of my employees, so he's very comfortable with me and worked for me for a long time. But he's instantly like, I just need to practice my English. There's no one for him to talk to under normal circumstances that actually knows English. He can talk to some people who are also taking it in school, but that just skews you off more, right? So I have a friend who's an English teacher and and she struggled all the time. She could come to me and say, hey, I don't know how to say these words. And I'd be like, oh, this is this, this is that, this is how you pronounce it, this is what it means, here's the nuances, here's how you use it. And she would go back and be like, oh, that's what I thought, but all the other teachers who have more experience than me tell me I'm wrong, and the official policy being pushed down is to teach wrong English, because there's no actual English speaker to be an authority and say, you're, you're not speaking English. Right, so they're just making up their own thing because they're they're the person who's been there the longest. So who's going to contradict them? Because it's you know just the school system. Those things are really dangerous. Social media is fixing so many of those things. It's giving access to people who didn't have access before. It's lowering social barriers, and it's allowing people who otherwise would be physically isolated. We as humans are typically physically isolated to at best our local community and many people to our homes, and with social media, your your children 
are able to grow up in a world where they will probably never lose contact with the, the majority of the friends that they make. They will understand what's going on in other people's lives. They will communicate with them and they will have a much larger social group than we ever did because they're physically able to do so. The ability to be social, the ability to have friends, the ability to communicate, the ability to share ideas is so much better. And a lot of people have argued that the benefit to traditional school is providing these things. And there's twofold here. One is I feel 100% confident in saying that that is absolutely in no way whatsoever something that school has ever done. School as it is normally done with the formal classrooms and someone talking to the students and you all sit quietly, it couldn't be more antisocial and more designed to not allow you to do those things. Of course, there's exceptions where there's teachers that are like, let's all talk, let's all communicate, let's be social, but that's the exception, a very rare exception, not the rule. It, it teaches bad socialization, it teaches just shut up and listen to people. No one should want their kids to be those kids. You may want everyone else's kids to be those kids. That's why school's so popular, because you want everyone else's kids to sit down, shut up, and do what you tell them to do. So we all want to push school because it's good for us as long as it's not our kids. So think about all the people promoting school. They're not looking out for your kids. They're looking out for themselves. But you need to look out for your kids and say, wait, I don't want my kid to be taught to be a Muppet who has to sit quietly and listen to what they're told and not speak back and not form their own ideas. And if they do form their ideas, okay, but keep it to yourself. Don't share it with people. Then you're a troublemaker or then you're talking back or whatever make sure that they just shut up and take the abuse or take the misinformation or take good information, but not vet it. So that's what they're taught. That's how school is presented. That is super unhealthy, super antisocial, and absolutely no one should want that as the result for their kids. Some, some kids learn well by sitting in those classrooms, and we all went through this torture. We all know how awful it is, and we all know how it had nothing to do with educating us, because that is not a form, that is not a system by which good pedagogy is done. Any study of education immediately tells you that all of these processes that we standardly do are the worst things you could do for a student. It's not good for their mental development. It's not good for passing on information. It's not good for critical thinking. It's not good for deep understanding or uh, making the, the mental connections about the issues. And it's not good for vetting. It teaches all bad habits in every possible way. So none of that is good. None of that is a type of socialization. None of that that you want at all. If it even is social, it's an anti-socialization and it's not good integration. Like it's all negative by and large, except for just a little bit of like, okay, here's the standard things everyone gets taught. But trust me, someone will give you that information so you can teach it too. But also the idea that it takes away the opportunities to then be social. If you aren't in school, like my kids, they're able to hang out with each other and talk all the time. They're able to come to us as adults and talk all the time. They're able to talk to uh, employees and, and partners and friends who come to the house all the time. They're able to make other friends and talk to them all the time. The only people that they aren't able to be social with all the time are other kids their age that aren't homeschool who are stuck in school and aren't allowed to communicate with each other and are in an antisocial situation. All of those kids are sitting there not being social, not learning to socialize, not developing those things. And when they do get a chance to do so, often it is a commiserating with other prisoners of the school system who are also children who have a child's perspective at adults that effectively are their wardens. And they see it as a them versus us. We all know this. We all grew up in this, right? We know that we all commiserated with how we were being held captive by these people who really weren't looking out for us. We knew they weren't looking out for us. We could sense in most cases they weren't looking out for us. It's palpable, right? This is just a job where they imprison children in most cases. This is not a healthy thing. We all feel it. And then our social interaction is one of the same sense that prisoners have. Well, that's them imprisoning us. We want to figure out how we can get away with things. How do we do less? We didn't agree to any of this. It's not in our interest. We have no reason to participate and want to participate and be good participants. And that's, that's actually the healthy reaction. But it's not a healthy situation where that's how you're growing up, having a children against the adults, because when they become adults, it doesn't make sense anymore. And, and it, now they've moved the barrier and they see themselves as the enemy and, and their worldview doesn't hold up well. But if you socialize in a more healthy way, our children spend the majority of their time interacting with adults and get treated yeah. much like adults most of the time. And that gives them a chance to have better social interactions and, and learn to interact in a much more mature way in a much more advanced way. They use much more advanced language. Uh, they're expected to speak like adults, not to speak like children. Uh, and it, it's really noticeable how little effort it takes for them to socialize so much better. And you put them into situations where they're hanging out with adults. Yes, other kids are good at sit down, don't make a sound, and, and stay unnoticed. 
right? Other kids that I know, they're really good at sneaking around and getting away with things because it's us versus them. My kids have none of those skills, which admittedly would be nice if they, they learned a few of them. Sometimes they need to get away with a few things. But in general, my kids interact like adults. If they want to do something, they argue for it. They provide logic and say, here's why they should do it. If someone says something they don't think is true, they question them on it. They vet their sources. They make sure that people aren't just allowed to say anything that they want and get away with it. They're going to call them out on it as they should, as every good member of society should, when you let people just run roughshod over other people or you, it empowers them to do more of that. But if we as a society constantly call people out, point out when people are giving false information, point out when people are acting badly, point out when people are being bullies, point out when people just aren't checking their sources and need to, we'll all benefit. This isn't something that just benefits your kids. This is what being a great member of society, not just Nicaraguan society, world society, everybody wins except for the people that you're pointing out aren't doing those things. And we don't really care about them because they're doing bad things. If they want to be someone we care about, that's their choice. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. I hope that this was a helpful, long-winded look at why I think homeschooling, when you're able to do it well, is a really good and important option. And not just in spite of the reasons that people often say it's bad, but because of them. It's not in spite of the socialization. It's because it provides better socialization. It's not despite the integration. No, it's because of the better integration. It's not despite the education. It's because of the integration. It's because you want to do the right thing for your child, your children, and you want them to not only benefit most, but then have a mindset of doing the best thing to give back to the society that enabled them, that empowered them, that invited them to be a member therein. And that's something that homeschool can do and it's up to you to do homeschool well for them. But if you don't leverage that power, that is a huge benefit for your children and your family that you may be giving up. So I encourage you to take a very hard look at why a private or public school might be beneficial for you, but with a critical eye towards not letting a sales pitch uh, convince you that it carries some benefits that it probably doesn't. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Just go on, throw in a credit card. It's a very well-known site. And that comes directly to me and helps me pay for the cameras and the microphones and all the things that we need to do this show and the computers and the software. And it really adds up. I really appreciate it. We've had so much, so much outpouring of response of support uh, this week. It's been an amazing week here on the show. And of course, we've had a few little negative things, but even those have prompted so many positive things that it's, it's been really fantastic. So I thank you all for being members of this amazing community and just the great interactions that we have uh, and that I get to look forward to every day to reading the comments rather other than dreading it as so many people who do this do. It's easy for this to be a job that really beats you down. And with the audience that I have, it really is not. It is a blessing to get to do this. And I got to speak to several of you on the phone today, which is absolutely amazing. It was so great getting to know you guys. You guys obviously know who you are. And uh, thank you for that. If you'd like to help, if you'd like to help support the channel, like and subscribe, share on social media, tell a friend or family member about the show, get them, you know, hooked on it and watching the show on a regular basis. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And in the last seconds of the show, while I was recording it, a bird flew over and pooped on my head. That, that's my day. <laughs>